It's most welcome to everyone now that we have solved the technical aspects. My name is Etienne Basso. I would like to welcome you all for this event and in particular to welcome our first vice president, uh, Mrs. Metzola. I would like also to welcome our audience uh, in Brussels and much beyond, as far as I understand, that are following us on the WebEx platform, WebEx platform and also on the EP web streaming. I uh, welcome also our speakers, uh, Professor Olivier Roy, Pierre Mirel, Daniel Fiot, and also our own EPRS colleagues, uh, Branislav Stanicek and Elena Lazaro. We all welcome to this event. So why this event on the Mediterranean and why having it now? The Mediterranean has always been a place of very strong, very strong engagement for the European Union. It has been a place where policies have been practiced, have been tested, not least the enlargement and the neighborhood policy. But it has never been an easy place. We all remember, we have in mind, uh, a bit more than 10 years ago, the uh, Arab Springs and a lot of hope that were put in these, these Arab Springs and unfortunately the uh, setback that we had afterwards and the authoritarian uh, regimes that were even uh, made stronger. Uh, we see also the emergence of new radical Islamist movement or jihadist groups and we can say that there is even some sort of Middle Easternization of, uh, of the Mediterranean space. If you have, for example, um, uh, difficulties, problems, um, civilians are, um, are harassed in a state like Nigeria, we see repercussions up to the Mediterranean space. So we see how much this place is a concentration of problems that are surrounding. We also all have in mind the economic fragility that is uh, still there and unfortunately continuing and uh, also the demographic pressure leading, uh, leading in many cases to uh, the migration that, that we know. Uh, there are also new challenges uh, such as um, the one on resources that have been emerging and that are putting a lot of uh, pressure. I was uh, reading a calculation about natural gas um, that uh, the reservoir of natural gas and other resources, which reserve estimated uh, 500 trillion cubic feet, which is roughly comparable to the US continental reserve. So we see there are many challenges uh, there. So how can we, uh, for example, integrate uh, the use and prevent the radicalization? Uh, we see also that Turkey is testing our strategic autonomy and more fundamentally our capacity to defend our interests and external frontiers. Are we ready uh, for the challenge in the Eastern Mediterranean, the site of estimated gas reserve that could supply the EU for eight years? And are we ready, of course, to forge a common uh, migration policy that will be strong enough, but also uh, show uh, solidarity? So uh, these are all the questions that we will have to, to discuss today and we see how multifaceted the situation is. Without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce our vice president, first vice president, to introduce uh, to introduce our discussions today. And um, Vice President Metzola has a very strong background in justice and home affairs. She has been uh, elected to the uh, she has been elected to European Parliament in 2013 and was elected vice president of the European Parliament in 2020. She was the first female uh, MEP from Malta. She is now a member of the Committee on Civil Liberties and Justice and Home Affairs. And during her uh, work in the European Parliament, she was Rapporteur on the European Border and Coast Guard Regulation in uh, 2019. Previously, she served in the permanent representation of Malta and the EU as a legal advisor to the High Representative for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy. And she graduate, graduated in law and politics from the University of Malta and the Collège, Collège d'Europe in Bruges. I like also to mention that she's responsible for uh, the dialogue that is conducted under Article 17 of the treaty uh, for uh, with religions and non-confessional uh, organizations. So there couldn't be a better a keynote speaker to introduce that event today. And I'm very happy uh, to hand over to uh, Vice President uh, Roberta Metzola. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Basso. Thank you for this introduction. Thank you for giving me uh, the privilege of addressing uh, such an important uh, seminar. Uh, as you already introduced it, I will continue and build up uh, as the Mediterranean 
being, let's say, the meeting point for three continents, each uh, with their own rich and complex histories. And so it is no surprise that it has long been in the eye of the storm. What we mean is the cultural and linguistic storm that make it one of the most vibrant places on Earth. The storm of ideas, theorems and philosophies that have put it and the countries around its basin on the map. And indeed, if the first map ever was anything to go by, the Mediterranean was all that there was. The cradle of civiliz civilization has given the world so much and yet more and more often it is also taking away taking away the lives of so many men, women and children crossing from its southern shores to the northern ones in search of a better life and who are drowning in a nondescript place somewhere in the middle. The lives of so many others caught up in conflict or the periods of starvation and deprivation that follow. The traditional livelihoods of communities in the north, south and east who are at the mercy of different storms altogether, the kind brought on by climate change. At the moment, the European Parliament holds the presidency of the Parliamentary Assembly for the Union of the Mediterranean. And here we are working towards restoring our commitment to resolute political action in the, in the region, in line with our conviction that constructive dialogue is paramount for cooperation. We cannot ignore the fact that geopolitical tensions between major players have come to head in a recent months in the Mediterranean and regional stability remains a key common objective. The problem of stability has been compounded by the COVID-19 pandemic, which over the past year has fueled alarming trends. Negative economic forecasts are a cause of concern on both shores of the Mediterranean, and we must do our utmost to prevent any risk of new eruptions of social tensions that have either remained unresolved or even an unaddressed. The communication for a new agenda for the Mediterranean shows that Europe wants to contribute directly to a long-term vision of prosperity and stability of the region and represents a promising background to relaunch with strong financial tools the cooperation between the two shores of the Mediterranean. If we wish to ensure that the problems we face today do not weaken our capacity for cooperation in the region, we must remain vigilant. One priority topic for the region is the fight against climate change. Climate change is already having a very significant impact on the main factors of instability in the region. Migration, conflicts, social cohesion. And the situation is getting worse. So we want a clear commitment to place the issue of global warming in the Mediterranean at the heart of Euro-Mediterranean cooperation. It is also impossible to discuss the Mediterranean without discussing and speaking about migration, without acknowledging the symmetry of broken lives and broken dreams that our sea has become. Here, the European Commission has acknowledged the Parliament's calls and has issued a new agenda for migration that has fair sharing of responsibility and solidarity at its very core. Legislation cannot be created in a vacuum. And as lawmakers, we need to be able to understand what causes people to flee, what obstacles they face, and how the EU, working and acting together, can help address them. It is perhaps too easy to forget, after the media spotlight has faded, that behind every number, there is a life. We have to move beyond fortress Europe. Immigration is not simply an issue that can be solved, but a reality that we must manage together. But it is also true that Europe does not have unlimited resources, and those resources should be used for those who are truly in need. Those who do not qualify for protection should be safely but firmly returned, and we need more efficient systems for this to happen. Migratory flows in the Mediterranean are also closely linked to the still unsettled situation in Libya. The insecurity and economic turmoil has left a vacuum for human trafficking networks to operate. Now, the time pressure is real. The European Union can offer its unique position to continue to play an important part in helping to build confidence and assisting the process in Libya without imposition. 
It is a role that the European Union also needs to continue to play in ending the divisions in Europe's last divided capital, Nicosia, in Cyprus. The split of the city is an open wound that we must seek to heal. A sustainable solution to reunify the island of Cyprus and its people can only be found through dialogue, di diplomacy and negotiations. And here, let me reiterate the Parliament's strong support for a fair, comprehensive and viable settlement with a single international legal status. And I am hopeful that the EU will play a more active role in bringing the negotiations under UN auspices to a successful conclusion. Because the Mediterranean, the European Union, will never be whole or complete while Cyprus remains divided. And as the hurt in Cyprus festers, Turkey continues to distance itself from European values and standards. Tensions in the Aegean Sea and the Eastern Mediterranean have not been conducive to good neighbourly relations. And it is high time to seriously reflect on the state of the EU's relations with Turkey and to draw up a comprehensive, unified and coherent strategy for the medium and long term. And building on the issue of the need for long term approaches, the situation in Israel and Palestine remains extremely worrying. The recent escalation of violence is of pressing concern and our appeal is for everyone to stop fire and end the violence before it grows further. As the UN Special Coordinator said, the cost of war is being paid by ordinary citizens. So we need first and foremost to restore calm. It is perhaps the longest brewing conflict around the Mediterranean, but that does not make it any less urgent. So the EU stands ready to provide assistance towards a two-state solution. And I think that the Conference on the Future of Europe that has just kicked off will be the right forum also to discuss how the Union can better coordinate its foreign policy in order to ensure that, especially in areas as sensitive as the Middle East peace process, it can speak with one coherent voice. In conclusion, as I've used up uh, Mr. Basso, my allocated time, and I've only scratched the surface of the regional, cultural, political and religious melting pot that, our, uh, that is our Mediterranean, let me go back to the title of this event, Building Peace and Resilience Through Dialogue and Cooperation. There is no other way to build a lasting peace, and we've learned that uh, in the European Union. So we can use our experience, our history, to get people to talk to each other, to get them to understand why they must speak to each other. And while much of my speech, of course, today is surrounded as, a, as an introduction around the struggles of the region, I remain ultimately very optimistic because we are at a point in history where we can find solutions to intergenerational struggles. We can find lasting peace. And the European Union can be the catalyst for that because history does not have to repeat itself endlessly. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vice President, for this uh, uh, introduction where you touch so many uh, crucial issues, climate change, solidarity, the need for a long-term strategy, and also touching upon the uh, heated situation in Israel, Palestine, uh, and, and so on and so forth, but also to, to bring uh, a message uh, of hope in your, uh, in your intervention. So many thanks, many thanks for taking the time, many thanks for, for being with us today. Uh, so, uh, I would like to hand over for the moderation of this event to Elena Lazaru. Elena Lazaru is an external policy expert. She's with us uh, in the EPRS uh, for many years now, and she's been recently appointed acting head of the external policies unit. And I'm very happy to uh, hand over to her to uh, moderate the panel discussion. Over to you, Elena. Thank you very much, Etienne. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, I'll, uh, I'll skip one second away from my, the point I was going to make to especially thank uh, the Vice President Roberta Mitsola for her opening remarks, which not only touched upon several points, as, as, as Etienne said, but also I think personally touched a lot of people from the various parts of the Mediterranean. So, so thank you very much um, for these, uh, these comments. And may I also say thank you for accepting our invitation, uh, adding my thanks to those of Etienne. Uh, before I go into the uh, sort of homekeeping and uh, housekeeping and management of the panel, I'd also like to add a few more thanks uh, for this event. 
first of all, to our panelists for accepting the invitation. Uh, secondly, to my colleague Branislav Stanicek, who has been behind the concept, the speakers and the organization of this event. Um, to the EPRS team uh, behind the, your screens, but also to one speaker that is notably missing today, uh, which is Professor Maris Tadros from the University of Sussex. You've seen her on the program. Unfortunately, she could not be with us today for health reasons, but I think uh, in the context as well of um, Roberta Metzola being the first female MEP from Malta um, in the context of our gender balance policy and everything that the EU is doing, it's important to mention that this panel was not originally planned to be an all-male panel, so, so just to make this point. Etienne and, uh, and, and, and the Vice President Metzola have said a number of things on the complexity of the region that we are about to speak uh, on today, and, and I would not dare open up all these boxes, but I think um, it's fair to say that everything that is internal in the EU's policies has also is also part of its relationships with with the Mediterranean uh, climate has been mentioned economy prosperity migration there is so much that connects the two shores of the Mediterranean that it's almost an internal external issue um, I refrain from quoting Fernand Brodel which usually is the way to start this kind of panel but I will say that I will quote Stefano Sanino the secretary general of the EAS from just yesterday saying for the amount of challenges and interests that the EU and the South Mediterranean share, the gap between the two shores remains too wide. And then he proceeded mentioning various areas in which we need to engage uh, and, and to discuss military or security uh, issues. Um, the gap is indeed wide. Um, the gap is one that uh, the EU has tried to explore for many, many years. And, and our speakers today will testify to this because they bring with them long-standing experience ranging back to the times of the Barcelona process. Um, and, and I will turn to them right now to, to start uh, their analysis, going not only uh, back in the timeline of the EU's engagement to today uh, with the presentation of the new agenda on the Mediterranean in February, uh, but also horizontally with their thematic expertise. Um, without further ado, um, just to present the panel before I give over to them, we have with us Professor Olivier Hua, I would say a reference point uh, on the Mediterranean for several years. He's professor and chair in Mediterranean studies at the EUI in Florence, a partner of EPRS, and has extensively written on religion uh, in the area, as well as other uh, things. Um, Pierre Mirel uh, is research fellow and associate professor at Sciences Po Paris. He is also an honorary director general of the European Commission, where he has held various posts working on enlargement um, and the neighborhood, again, bringing with him extensive experience from the Commission. Uh, Daniel Fjot is the security and defense editor of the EU Institute for Security Studies, where he works on all issues, defense, uh, security, defense industry, and very known for his recent work on uh, strategic compass under the Portuguese presidency. And Branislav Stanicek, finally, policy analyst at the External Policies Unit at EPRS, uh, uh, working uh, in our team, formerly head of cabinet and advisor to the special envoy for the promotion of freedom of religion of belief outside the EU. So religion also comes in here uh, in this area. So I will start uh, by turning to Professor Hua to draw on his experience and his expertise to give us an overview of what the issues are in the Mediterranean and why uh, for so many years uh, the EU has been trying to find the correct way to engage with the region uh, and yet we find ourselves today with a new strategy and what do we see looking forward. Thank you very much. Um, the, the main issue uh, or the more uh, hot uh, uh, issue concerning Mediterranean is certainly uh, the mobility of population and of course uh, migration and immigration. That's a priority for uh, public opinion, that's a priority for uh, our political leaders and it's a long, long story. The story of migration started in the same time than the building of the European Union, you know, uh, the late 50s. And so uh, the issue of um, migration through Mediterranean is uh, um, uh, consecutive, if I can say that, of the history of the uh, European uh, Union. Uh, if we look uh, uh, at the legacy, we have, of course, the colonial legacy uh, for North Africa, uh, uh, Libya also, uh, to a lesser extent, uh, Egypt, and of, of course, uh, uh, Palestine. Uh, but uh, what is important is the way the uh, colonial legacy 
uh, was connected to labor, labor migration. So the big issue uh, uh, started with the labor migration of the 60s. Uh, this labor migration in continental Europe uh, concerned mainly uh, North Africa and uh, Turkey. Uh, so it's uh, 60, uh, 70 years ago. So we have now second and third generation. And it's more and more difficult to speak about migration. Uh, we have new generations of European citizens. That's a fact. You know. uh, they are integrated in terms of the, uh, linguistic terms, for instance, uh, uh, work, uh, in terms of uh, 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 job occupations also. Uh, uh, even if they are more strongly represented in the uh, lower uh, uh, classes. Uh, and the, the big issue concerning this second and third generation is not so much the integ integration of individuals than the integration of Islam as a European religion. That's the big issue. And it's, this issue is less and less connected uh, with the countries of origin. Although, uh, we tend to uh, uh, sign agreements with Morocco, Turkey, Algeria, Egypt concerning the training of imams. There is clearly a growing demand among uh, European Muslims to have their own European places of training, uh, their own faculties of uh, Islamic theology, uh, etc., and in the uh, uh, European languages. So I think that's the first issue, you know, to work precisely not in connecting but disconnecting you know uh, uh, islam in europe with the countries of origin which is not of course very popular among the countries of origin mm -hmm. uh, but we can see with turkey in uh, our tense relations now with a uh, tense difficult relations with turkey now that it's a, a, a real issue and this second and third generation are still mobile but we must speak about mobility more than immigration we have, if, uh, let's take Turkey, for instance. Turkey is no more a place of immigration to Europe, as far as Turks are concerned. Uh, but we have many second and third generation uh, uh, of Turkish origin uh, uh, in Europe who go back in Turkey, not necessarily to settle, but, but they have a mobility between Turkey and Germany, for instance. It's the same in France with Tunisia uh, and specifically Morocco. So it's a circular mobility. It's no more a migration as such. Uh, even if in Tunisia, we still have young migrants also from uh, uh, Morocco. Uh, uh, so uh, I think that the important thing is to acknowledge you know, uh, the generational changes and to address the demands of these generational changes, not in terms of multiculturalism, because they speak now French, German, etc., but in terms of uh, uh, looking at Islam as a European religion. The second point is the uh, present uh, 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 migrations. And we have now uh, uh, migrations, uh, 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 new boat people coming from Libya, coming from Tunisia, or going through Turkey. But these people are not Turkish, they are not uh, uh, Americans, there are very few Tunisians, almost no Algerians, few Libyans. These people are coming from Africa, from everywhere. Many of them are Muslims, but it's not a religious migration, it's not a labor migration, it's not a mass migration. And so this kind of uh, fluxes have to be negotiated with the gatekeepers, you know, uh, uh, Turkey, Libya, Tunisia, Morocco. And of course, uh, uh, they uh, uh, ask for some things in exchange of uh, uh, being the gatekeepers. So that's the uh, main issue now uh, uh, for this new kind of migration. You know. But we have also a third uh, kind of migration, political refugees. And here we are, of course, uh, 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 it depends on the political situation. The uh, most important cases, as you know, is Syria, uh, where we had a sudden influx of hundreds of thousands of Syrians you know, to, to Europe. Interestingly enough, it went quite well for a very simple reason. The people who migrated are educated middle class people. Uh, they uh, migrated in family, so they, are, they have more uh, uh, ties uh, uh, between themselves, and they have been able to integrate far more rapidly than the first generation of labor migration before. So to conclude, I would say we have to consider the different levels of uh, circulations to have a specific policy towards these different levels and towards the uh, countries of the South. 
example. We don't speak with the Moroccan, uh, the Moroccan government the same way when we discuss about Islam in France, for instance, than when we discuss about the sub-Saharan uh, sub populations coming through Morocco. It's not the same issue. So we should have a more pragmatic uh, 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 policy uh, towards the South concerning this issue of uh, mobility of population. Thank you very, very much. Uh, this is uh, very insightful, and I think we'll come back to this topic, uh, not only in the Q&A, but, uh, but also perhaps during the discussion. Um, I, I move to Pierre Mirel now. Um, Professor Hua concluded by saying we should have a more pragmatic policy towards the region in terms of the migration. Uh, pragmatism is definitely one thing. Um, the vision of the Commission for the Region is another, and, and, and I, I would like to draw on your experience from the Commission uh, to give us a bit of a flavor of what, what the EU has been trying to do in the region for, for the past several years, decades, and also your evaluation of the new uh, agenda for the Mediterranean presented in February, and especially the emphasis on resilient societies, perhaps. Thank you, thank you, uh, Elena. Um, hello, everybody. Pleasure to be on this panel. A uh, few words maybe to answer your first question, um, in a sense that this new agenda is obviously the, how should I say, the successor of a great number of policy frameworks that the EU has put forward with the countries in the region over the past 25 years, starting with Barcelona process, 95, and a few years later with mixed results, instead of, that's my opinion, instead of deepening, reviewing, it was simply bluntly replaced by neighborhood policy, which was in a sense a mirror of Eastern policy with, with uh, um, developed with Eastern countries, as if, you know, uh, one single policy could fill all, uh, fit all the different countries and so different indeed from the East to the, to the South. I think it was a mistake personally. And then three years later, Union for Mediterranean was, was launched I mean, it added to the confusion, you know, within a few years, changing like this. Then 2011, new strategy after the Arab Springs, new strategy for a, um, a changing uh, neighborhood, as it was called, was adopted in a very hasty manner. The only positive element, in my view, was that it put the emphasis really on the importance and role and support of civil society. That was really uh, uh, the key, uh, the key element in that new uh, communication. Revised again four years later, in 2015. Um, what I retain from the 2015 is a very humble uh, uh, sort of assessment of the situation, because the uh, the Commission and High Rep in that communication uh, said, "I'm quoting." that um, acknowledge that demo, uh, democratic transition will take time and that social and political reality should be taken into account. I would like to add, at last. Um, so that, that this is basically what preceded this, this, this new agenda. Now, does the new agenda fit that reality today? Um, I would like to distinguish maybe five, five parts. It's a bit artificial. I mean, I'm not just following the uh, what the agenda is saying, but five parts. Well, first of all, there is what I would call, let's say, the classical components of any sort of external um, uh, policy of, of, the, um, of the EU. Um, I mean, good governance, rule of law, uh, human rights, democracy, etc. Then human development, youth, education, vocational training, etc. And sustainable economic development. That's all good. This is not new. It was part of the previous frameworks. But that's positive, that's good. Then the second group is what I would say the new, very positive, undisputable, and needed uh, elements and that really reflects the, the message that uh, Roberta Metzola passed. Climate change, you know, energy, climate change, green transition, uh, resilience, in particular in post-COVID uh, uh, situation, and digitalization of both economy and the society. That's excellent. The third, uh, group is uh, is migration and mobility. But the three first action points that are mentioned in this document, and I quote, are supporting effective migration and asylum government policy, including border management. Second, 
providing assistance to create social opportunities for migrants, in other words, to avoid that they would move to the northern shore, and third, stepping up cooperation on effective return and readmission. Basically, that, that answers what uh, Olivier Roy was saying, you know, helping, reinforcing the gatekeepers, right? Fine, that's understandable and that's good from the EU point of view. Very difficult for the countries to accept that. Difficult because, and that, that's my fourth point, in return, what is the EU offering? Trade? No, trade is absent from the new, uh, from the new agenda. There's nothing on trade. Surprisingly, for a, a you know, European Commission where trade is one of the main elements, there is nothing on trade. We know that there are deep free trade agreements being negotiated for years with Jordan, Morocco and Tunisia, but yet, I mean, there should be something. There's nothing. Second, investment. Well, yes, investment plan is mentioned. Seven billion. Is it, is it big? No, it's a very small amount. It's exactly the total of what was foreseen under the seven-year uh, financial plan. Far too small, too little for, you know, for the needs of, of the countries. The good thing is that there is very concrete in terms of action points under the so-called 12 flagships which have been imported from similar uh, proposal for the Western Balkans, by the way, in 2018. That's good. But what the EU is offering as a quid pro quo on migration is really far too little. And my fifth uh, sort of part, my reading of, of the, the agenda, uh, concerns peace and security. And here, I must say, um, I almost was falling out of my chair. Um, you know, when you read, that the EU has built credibility with a consistent position on respect of international law, I'm not sure that the Palestinian Authority today, what's happening in, in the region, would agree. Mm -hmm. uh, since the you know, two, uh, 242 uh, resolution has not been respected for how many years? 50 years. Um, the second point, and that's probably the most interesting in this communication on peace and security, it says the EU is uniquely placed to contribute to solving conflicts. Fine, but it adds, providing it is united and able to speak in unison. And we know very well it was not able to do that in Libya. And I think this is the, one of the weak or weakest points of this agenda, but actually one of the weak point of the EU as a whole unable to speak in unison because there's no foreign policy, there's no common foreign policy. Um, but, but in a sense, this communication, this, this new uh, agenda is too shy on this issue. Hence, nothing on the conflict. In addition to that, um, I think there are several um, missing issues which are not addressed uh, in that region. A, regional cooperation. It is so needed. You know, complementary economies, Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco, I know it's difficult. I know that for 40 years, there have been discussions on possible common market, etc. Yet there should be something, there's nothing. Demography, I mean, there's nothing on demography. We all know that uh, Egypt is, as someone said once, is a demographic bomb. Even high, uh, high representative Boel wrote on his blog on the 2nd of March that economic growth, whatever it is, even the highest one, cannot catch up with population increase. So basically, some of the countries on, on, the, uh, uh, on this part of, uh, of, uh, of Mediterranean uh, Sea um, pro, uh, you know, are creating no hope generation. Um, and this is what, in a sense, what is pushing uh, people to, or young people to leave. There's nothing on that. Uh, third, discrimination. Discrimination of minorities. Nothing on discrimination against Coptics in Egypt, Berbers in North Africa, harassment of non-Muslims, or harassment of Muslims who don't follow the rules, you know, uh, as, as they are supposed to be for some people. Um, Non-respect of international law, I mentioned it. Nothing special on Tunisia. We all claim, newspapers every day claim that Tunisia was the big success, you know, uh, uh, after the Arab Springs. But we, it ignores that Tunisia is close, I should not say, close to collapse, but at least the social economic situation is extremely tense, extremely serious. There should have been something, at least on debt restructuring, you know, 
preparing for something. Um, last remark on, in my view, what's missing, it says many of the challenges result from global trends. Well, I would not say many, several, yes. But what the agenda does not say is that several of the challenges result from internal problems, state capture, corruption, military uh, oligarchs in, in power in Egypt and, and, uh, and, and Algeria. So, you know, it, it, it ignores that. It should, you know, shame, name and shame. Otherwise, it's a bit theoretical and, and, and empty. So overall, I think the, I wonder, you know, when I, when I was reading again yesterday this new agenda, I wondered what, what it was intended for, certainly not for countries in war. You know, Syria, Libya, Palestine, I um, mean, too far from, from what the new agenda is about. Or a failed state, Lebanon, I mean, come on. Um, so um, maybe uh, primarily for Tunisia, Jordan and, and Morocco, well, that's a bit limited, but it's missing really a number of, uh, of key issues in that part of the uh, Mediterranean. I think the, the, um, it, it contains a number of good things, um, and, and uh, that, that's uh, excellent on digitization, green sun, transition, etc. But overall, I think the EU lacks the capacity to project itself as a strategic uh, player. And, and the key point here is that before being geopolitical, as uh, uh, Hyre Borrell said recently, it should first be political, meaning speak in unison. Thank you. Many, many thanks. Um, I, I think you have actually made my work easy because you've ended at a very good point for us to move to Daniel, also with your references, not only to the need for the, uh, the EU to act as, as one actor, to be strategic, and the peace and security dimension. But before I do turn to Daniel, um, I would just like to say that um, uh, first of all, to thank you because you did what we would call here a scrutiny, I think, of the agenda, and that is definitely something that is welcome in the Parliament. Uh, but also, because you raised this important issue of, of, of a strategy for a region which is functional, which is based on functional cooperation in many ways and, and various areas, but the politics are perhaps so important to keep in mind. And, and when one thinks back to other attempts, like the Union for the Mediterranean and then Israeli-Palestinian conflicts erupting, right the year after and soon after the issues with Syria. So it seems like a circle, the EU is having a strategy for the Mediterranean, but then the politics and the, the dynamics of the region um, coming uh, to, 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 to halt that. So that's really something to take away. Um, I will move to Daniel, but I'll also remind the audience that since this is a virtual event, you don't have to wait until the Q&A um dedicated time to start writing your questions so feel free to use the chat function uh, the q a function to start posing questions and i will now turn to daniel to talk to us about the mediterranean um, in the context of the eu security and defense policy in which if i'm not mistaken there's been quite a bit of movement uh, in recent uh, years so daniel the floor is yours Thank you very much, uh, Elena, and uh, thanks uh, firstly to the organizers, EPRS, for the invitation. It's a very kind invitation. Uh, also, uh, very good to be in such a prestigious panel. I think it's always difficult to follow on from uh, the speakers. Uh, I also think that uh, verse, uh, First Vice President Metzola actually laid out the, the scene very, very well, and so has uh, the two speakers before me. Uh, so it, uh, it makes my life a bit easier. So thank you very much. Um, when I read uh, the new agenda, uh, I came across some of the old uh, or continuous threats and challenges that we associate with the Mediterranean. Huh? So it, it talks about terrorism, violent extremism, radicalization, cyber threats, etc., organized crime, and so forth and so forth. Uh, it also speaks very um, well, I think, and this has been highlighted by a number of the speakers, about the growing challenge of climate change in the Mediterranean and the specific nature in which that will affect the Mediterranean basin as well. But of course, uh, at least from my perspective, one of the things that was uh, quite uh, drastically missing from the reflection process uh, is that the, the Mediterranean is not closed off to broader geopolitical uh, forces and trends. And, and that worries me quite uh, uh, greatly because I think on top of all of the challenges that the agenda does uh, put there on the table, 
uh, we are missing somehow the longer term actions of external powers, we can call them external, I guess, in the Mediterranean, such as Russia and China. Uh, and also in particular, it should be said uh, that uh, we are also dealing now in the Mediterranean increasingly uh, with a strategic vacuum that is being increasingly left by the United States, uh, which for various reasons has its eyes on China and the Indo-Pacific and, and, and Asia and has less political bandwidth to have a direct uh, uh, role in the Mediterranean. Uh, layered on top of that, of course, is the pandemic, uh, which itself may not cause, uh, let's say, long-term effects, but it, it certainly will aggravate existing trends. Uh, and it could also lead to um, uh, the exploitation of such trends by third powers as well. So I think following very much on from uh, what uh, Professor Merel has said as well, that um, we shouldn't uh, get stuck in the old mindset of, of, of referring to what the challenges in the Mediterranean are. And before this uh, event, by the way, I did a little bit of an experiment, which was to go back to the 2003 security strategy of the European Union, which of course references the Mediterranean, but it also references exactly the same challenges as in the new agenda. Uh, if you go to the global strategy, it says the same thing. Uh, so the Mediterranean is clearly important, but I think we do need to move a bit more clearer uh, in a geopolitical sense about some of the trends that we're facing. Let me build on them. Uh, I think uh, First Vice President Metzola said right at the beginning that the Mediterranean is a geographical confluence point of three continents. This is absolutely correct. Uh, but it is also the confluence for what I would call regional security complexes. So when we talk about the conflict in uh, the Middle East with uh, Syria possibly at the epicenter, that is a regional context which connects the Mediterranean into Persia and also into conversations now that we're having, very sensitive ones, about Afghanistan and the drawdown there, of course. Uh, we should also keep in mind with that specific conversation that even though uh, Islamic State or Daesh have been, uh, been at least seemingly beaten back, uh, in Syria and the uh, Middle East, uh, that they are still looking for a home, a new home from which to relaunch. And that can occur in many, many different places, of course, the Sahel being, uh, being the obvious one here. So we have to think of a confluence of continents, uh, cultures indeed, but also a confluence of security complexes that stretch to Afghanistan, that also extend to Nigeria, and of course, the west coast of Africa and the Gulf of Guinea, which is now uh, a, a, a very important part of the EU's um, overall approach, I think, to security and defense in the region. I've already spoken about the US drawdown in Syria and Iraq, uh, obviously the drawdown uh, in, um, in Afghanistan, but actually if you look at the US's actions in the Horn of Africa and even in the Sahel, uh, it, it's not to say that they're not present, but they are present in a very different way. It is more about uh, certain military capabilities that they can use for surveillance, uh, for logistic support, et cetera, et cetera. But it's actually the Europeans who will be um, expected to do the heavy lifting. And I come back actually to, to what uh, Professor Merel said in his last comment about uh, the unity of European foreign policy, because if the Europeans are expected to do more in places like the Sahel, uh, that's going to be quite a challenge because we're also speaking about a period of time where a lot of member states are not actually thinking about the South at all, uh, even if they should be. They're thinking about uh, territorial defense of the European uh, mainland. Uh, I, I hope that we could possibly have a bit more of a mature strategic discussion about how the Eastern dimension and the Southern dimension are bleeding into each other. And maybe let me uh, move in that direction now. The first is the role of Russia. We already know that Russia is a Mediterranean uh, player or actor. Uh, it has its base, its naval base in Tartus. It has, of course, access to the Mediterranean through the Black Sea and the Bosphorus. And we know very much that it is using tactics which uh, it's, it's perfected very well in Ukraine, uh, such as the use of paramilitaries and private military companies, even in places like Libya. So you see there uh, uh, groups like the Wagner Group, kind of quasi-paramilitary groups that are present in Libya. So already one example of where you cannot separate the eastern and southern dimension. It is a, a geographical whole, I would say. Turkey has already been mentioned very, very well, and I think uh, Branislav will probably go into that. So I don't want to talk too much about the Turkish dimension, but again, it's a very important case study of it not Turkey not just being an antagonist in the eastern Mediterranean, 
it also has a military footprint in Libya, and it also has a stake in the Syria conflict. So we're talking about the connection of geopolitical spaces here. Also, let me highlight the important role of China. Uh, maybe not a lot of people know that China's already had live naval exercises in the Mediterranean, which itself might seem shocking or not. But we also have to look a bit more broadly than this. We know that China um, famously has invested in the Piraeus uh, uh, port uh, in Greece. But do we also know that Chinese state-backed and state-owned companies have investments in over seven or even more than seven uh, strategic ports in the Mediterranean with financial stakes there? Also keep your mind on this uh, question of climate change, because climate change is not just about mitigation or dealing with humanitarian relief, but it is also about the transition to the green economy. And that means more of an investment in renewable energy infrastructure. Now, if you look at uh, where the investments sit on photovoltaic uh, uh, solar panels uh, of renewable infrastructures in the Mediterranean, it's again no surprise to learn that the Chinese have a huge footprint there. The other thing we know about the Chinese is that they're growing their, um, their navy at a rapid, uh, rapid pace as well. So I think we should keep the geopolitical uh, questions in mind. Uh, of course, I don't probably have the time to go into too much depth about uh, terrorism and the role of Daesh uh, or even um, uh, affiliated groups. But of course, there we see that the Sahel is not getting any better on that front either. And there is a lack of a European coordinated approach there even though we have experimented over the last few years with what we call uh, the uh, so-called regionalization of security and defense policy in the Sahel, which at least on the, on the kind of first look at this issue, it is about connecting our civilian and military missions and operations in the Sahel. But of course, I think everyone recognizes now that we need a much more comprehensive uh, and long lasting uh, uh, approach to, uh, to the Sahel. And Libya as well, with the unity government, that's fine. There seems to be uh, a very minimum level of stability. But uh, yet again, let's not be ignorant of the fact that the geopolitical players that I've mentioned, uh, Turkey and Russia, uh, are part of the equation of a lasting deal. And there is a question of whether or not foreign forces will ever leave uh, Libya, or will they leave any time soon to facilitate a lasting peace there? Again, there's a strong hesitation on both players to, to, to leave uh, Libya behind. Now, when it comes to the EU and its concrete action, of course, in the Mediterranean, the obvious example is IRENI, uh, an Operation IRENI itself, which is subject, of course, to political discussion. Uh, it's very, very good that we, we have uh, uh, the operation in the Mediterranean, but of course anyone even studying how it was set up will already detect uh, some of the political sensitivities between the member states. And also there is a question mark uh, about um, the proximity that the operation has from the root causes of conflicts on land. Okay, So we also recognize that it's there. Uh, to enforce the UN arms embargo and also to deal with certain other tasks uh, such as illegal exports of oil, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But it begs the question, uh, is that the full extent of the EU security and defense role in the, in the region or are we looking for something more? And it's that something more that um, we should probably discuss. I will end now, uh, Elena, by also referencing the strategic compass, which of course is a big part of the uh, EU's reflection now on security and defense. Uh, it will be hopefully published under the French presidency in March uh, 2022. And the Mediterranean there will be um, a core factor, I'm, I'm sure, within the compass. Uh, in fact, already the threat analysis, uh, which is a classified document, but what we know at least from the threat analysis that's in the public domain, is that one of the key threats that the member states have agreed on is the influence of uh, external powers in the regions that Europeans find of most importance to themselves, and also this great fear of spillover effects from conflicts, uh, from crisis, et cetera, et cetera. So when we look at the compass, of course, it should be able to respond, I think, to those very, very direct threats. The question which we all have, uh, even those working pretty close uh, to it as well, uh, is what will that mean in operational terms, okay? And, and there, I guess, the question, at least from the Mediterranean, is first, how comprehensive can we be with all of the tools that we have, especially given the geopolitical context which uh, I've outlined, uh, and uh, how are we going to put together these different geopolitical theatres uh, comprehensively? Because therein, that, therein lies the answer, I think, about how these different geopolitical hotspots connect with each other. 
Uh, I will end there for now, and hopefully we, we will have a, a good debate as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel, not only for giving this uh, geopolitical uh, picture of the region, but also for showing how in this security dimension, several threads are tied together from what Professors Wa and Mihel mentioned. For example, uh, the underlying sources of conflict being linked to religion, to discrimination against minorities, and even to climate and demographics. So it really all ties in. I'd also like to say that on several of the issues you mentioned, including the Russia uh, Turkey proxy dimension. We have several EPRS publications and a number of them you can find in the uh, invitation to the event, but also, as I understand, our team will post them now in the chat for anyone who is interested. Um, and with that, I will turn to our final speaker, the author of several of these publications, Branislav Stanicek, who regularly likes to refer to the arc of crisis uh, uh, ranging from the east to the west of the Mediterranean, but I would also say, having heard Daniel just now, maybe from the Sahel to Afghanistan, since it is a very, very big region uh, of crisis. So Branislav, uh, the floor is yours to, to talk to us about these crises. Yes, thank you, Eleni, and thank you also to other panelists, Professor Rua and Miral, and of course, Daniel, to take part in this panel. Um, before speaking really on geopolitical implication in the region, I would like to mention some remarks on the strategy and agenda per se. Actually, as said uh, Pierre Miral, this is a relaunch of, of the process and actually the Commission writes it down even in the agenda that they are relaunching the process. It, it means that, uh, and what is missing there is why we have not achieved so far so much during these past 25 years. Also, the, the second aspect is financial, that uh, we have allocated 7 billion for the agenda. But if we look on the questions linked to migration mentioned by Olivier Rua, the new border management uh, is allocated with 24 billions, so more than three times. And uh, obviously trade is missing. And how do we want to develop our neighborhood without the trade? So this is really something that is important to say at the beginning. Now on the geopolitics and so this famous arc of crisis, if we look on, on the region, on the Euromed, but also beyond, it means uh, we mentioned Afghanistan, we cannot forget Iran, and then uh, Sahel and Sub-Saharan Africa. The, the main hotspots mentioned by Daniel these geopolitical hotspots are moving. We remember in summer 2017, we have defeated Daesh or Islamic State in Iraq. But then these groups moved to Syria. From Syria, also with help of some regional powers, they moved to Libya. Now they are moving beyond Libya to Sahel and Sub-Saharan Africa. We see it in Chad, we see it in Mozambique. So this is something, a major threat that we have to address in a global uh, package of solution. And as said also by previous speakers, European Union is still missing a, really a common foreign policy. We, uh, the, the policy is fragmented and it was admitted also by in the past by High Representative Mogherini, for example, when she commented in the European Parliament the launching of the Operation Sofia, she said that we have naval operation without naval assets, without uh, the, the, the tools. Now the situation is slightly improved, especially in Libya, but still we have two regional power, Russia and Turkey, that are acting. Why it is so important? Because uh, if we will have prevented access to these uh, southern seas, if we will be in conflict with uh, Russia, with Turkey, if we have to negotiate with them some solutions that are not in our interest. Actually, Europe uh, would be limited to annex of the Euro-Asian continent. And actually what will remind us from geopolitical strategy is the Atlantic shore. And this disconnection from Asia would harm us on the long term very heavily. So I would like to explain more clearly 
also the situation of Turkey, and here maybe Ancestil can launch uh, the map so people can see uh, what is actually the situation, how complex is it. And uh, so here I would like to speak about one hotspot which is uh, linked to the Turkey and delimitation also of maritime areas. And uh, uh, we see that uh, this region, as said, Etienne Basso, is uh, very rich in natural resources. Estimation are 500 billion trillion of uh, cubic feet, which is equivalent of 80 years of consumption of EU in, in gas. So, of course, this is the, the area where we have geopolitical competition, economic competition. And uh, the competition is not always played by rules of international law. So if we use the football terminology, we, we see a lot of uh, faults or we see also some red cards that are raised here. So first, as a geopolitical interest, I would like to raise the question of the agreement from 2009, 2019, so-called Turkey-Libya Memorandum of Understanding, which you can see marked in, in blue colors. And actually, this uh, Memorandum of Understanding would divide Mediterranean into two portions, one in the west and one in the east. Actually, uh, at the beginning of when this memorandum of understanding was signed, the international community was a little bit perplexed, also European countries. And uh, the memorandum was ratified by, not by a Libyan parliament. And it was not very clear at the time if it would be also registered by the UN, but at the end it, it happened. So the question is now how this, uh, this uh, memorandum will influence the other treaties and continental shells of other countries. The second question is that these very rich natural resources are creating what positive effects and negative. Positive is that countries like Egypt or even Israel, they will be self-sufficient in energy, so they will be net exporters. Of course, that there are, there are competition on the limitation of the zones. And also the question is how to not only extract, but also uh, how to transfer this, uh, these resources to European shores. So there is one project, EastMet, that is marked in red, but uh, it has to pass through also this new Turkey-Libya exclusive zone, which is now not very clear what would happen with uh, this delimitation. Obviously, we mentioned already the question of Cyprus and uh, the question of uh, Greece and uh, countries competing for these resources. So, uh, when we speak about Libya and, and the countries in the region, so of course, there is this competition, but also there is a political hope. And the hope is that uh, we started political process in Libya with the Berlin conference last year. We have now agreement on the new government, provisional government, and also agreement on elections at the end of 2021. There will be also elections in other countries of the region. So presidential in Syria scheduled for this year, then we have also pres election presidential in Iran that would have certain influence on the region, probably more negative as more conservative uh, president could be elected. Then we have postponed elections in Palestine. So uh, if the European Union could accompany these political processes, it would could bring some peaceful resolution on some conflicts. At least we would be closer to this resolution. And my last uh, remark is uh, that we have to engage also more profoundly civil society, as it is mentioned in the agenda. So this is not a very easy task in the region because some political parties, are, our political system are not very developed in the sense as are in Europe. So we don't see uh, honest political competition. We see that civil society, youth organization, women organization are also not very strongly developed. 
On the other hand, there are new actors. For example, we already mentioned at the beginning churches, religious organizations, and uh, these could be very stable partners for the dialogue because they are respected in the countries, they are respected in the region, and they have also certain moral and political power. For example, we have seen in the past in Iraq that uh, Chaldean patriarch Sacco, he played a very positive role in the process of peace and reconciliation. We see in Lebanon, uh, Cardinal Bechara, Maronite patriarch, he's also a very respected figure. Three weeks ago, the head of EU delegation met with Pope Tavardros in Egypt, who is a Coptic Pope, and they signed together with the UN representative cooperation agreement on gender issues. So this uh, could be new actors for cooperation, and also for engagement of civil society. And my last point is that we have to engage also with a civil society represented by cities and regions, because in some countries, like Tunisia that men we mentioned uh, today, in some countries, also like Libya, there are huge differences, huge regional disparities. And we see uh, emerging and very positive, very innovative uh, political power in cities and in regions. So this is also one point that I would like to raise, that uh, civil society and, and cities and regions could be very innovative factors for reconciliation and dialogue. Thank you very much, Branislav. Thank you for, first of all, for raising this last point on civil society and the diversity of actors, because I believe this is also something that Professor Tadros would have brought in, working as she does on civil society and gender dimensions. And I think it's important that those elements are also brought in. Thank you as well for highlighting how the energy issue links up to the very security issues previously discussed. And as we all know, the energy transition is also linked to climate, so we see again there the interconnectedness of the issues. And for mentioning as well that uh, there are a lot of political changes potentially in the short term a horizon, a lot of elections coming up, and as has been observed globally, elections uh, have been influenced by COVID. So we are in an environment which is um, also influenced by the current pandemic trends. Uh, a note as well to those watching from iPhones or iPads in case uh, maps look very small and just to, to make clear that our map had also uh, the signaling of contested areas, maybe that um, uh, maybe it was too small for anyone to see, but just to be clarified to clarify the content of, of the map and that it also includes contested uh, areas as, as shown in the um, uh, in the index. Now, we already have a couple of questions, so I will move to read them out uh, and then uh, turn to the speakers and feel free to, to let me know if who, if, if I would turn to all of you for your comments, but feel free to, to pass on a given question if, if you would like. Um, so the first question is from Norbert Rizzo. It's actually on the delimitation of exclusive economic zones. And the question is, can or rather should the EU foster agreements between its southern member states regarding the delimitation of their exclusive economic zones, especially in the light of the fact that Turkey and Russia have already installed themselves in given uh, in given areas, namely Tripolitania and Cyrenaica. So this is, uh, can the EU foster agreement between southern states about the delimitation of their uh, exclusive economic zones? We also have one question by Vid Jereb, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, on climate migration. Um, the question reads, some projections show up to 400 million people will become displaced within the Middle East and Africa due to climate change in the next decades. Can Europe sustain such demographic pressure without collapsing or abandoning its values entirely? So how can the EU deal with the impact of climate migration um, in, in the region. So uh, what I will do is I will turn again to the panelists in the order that they spoke to see if they have any responses to this. And I will also add my own uh, quick question perhaps to, to Olivier Roy, uh, because um, I wanted to, to push you a bit on this issue of the societal fabric of, of the Mediterranean societies um, to, to ask you to elaborate for us a bit more 
how you think the EU should engage with these societies if it is to make them resilient, as is written, uh, not only actually in this new agenda, but actually in the global strategy as well and elsewhere. So, so I will turn again to the panel in the order that they spoke. And in the meantime, um, the audience can please feel free to ask more questions on any topic. So, Professor Roy. Thank you. As far as uh, civil societies are concerned, <clears throat> in uh, North Africa and Middle East, it's clear that we have a generational change, which is also a change of political culture. Uh, we are confronted, not confronted, we uh, are dealing with a, a new generation which is more educated, more uh, gender balance, you know, you have far more uh, uh, women involved in political movement. You just have to take to see the pictures of uh, present actual demonstration in Algeria, for instance, uh, with the same demonstration 20 or 30 years ago. So you have clearly a huge change. Uh, this new generation is more individualistic. Uh, it doesn't buy, you know, the myth of uh, pan-Arabism or pan-Islamism and so. This generation is not looking for uh, um, a, a, a great leader. They are not interested in charismatic leaders. And it's also a problem because they have no leaders. You know, they are not interested in building political parties or following leaders. So we are dealing with a change in political culture of uh, civil societies in the uh, uh, Middle East and Africa. And we are not used to that. Usually we work through NGOs, mm -hmm. uh, but NGOs, you know, are not a, a political movement. No. Uh, so how to encourage a transition toward a real political life. And of course, it supposes a pressure for more democracy, more freedom of expression. But here, as usual, we are stuck uh, because we prefer to deal with the existing regimes uh, for good or bad reasons. That's another, another story. So we have to invent you know, a new way, a new way to address the new uh, uh, generations. And I think that the fact that we have also new generations among uh, the uh, uh, second generation's migrants in Europe is an asset, you know, in approaching a transnational, uh, transmediterranean generational change. Uh, because in Europe also, we have new contested uh, movement of contestations which do not use the traditional political tools. Mm. So, in fact, we have a convergence, you know, uh, between uh, 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 forms of contestation and youth, contest youth contestation in the Middle East and in Europe also. Uh, 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 that's a, a, a big challenge. Thank you very much. Um, Professor Miguel, uh, if you would like to take the climate question or the uh, de delimitation of economic zones question, but perhaps to add my own little comment. Um, you spoke a lot about the strategy. You didn't, I, if I'm not mistaken, make a comment on the financial instruments. And we are waiting here in Parliament for the final publishing of the new instrument, the Neighbourhood Development and International Cooperation Instrument, NDICI in a month hopefully so so do you see anything coming out of the the new financial instruments and, and the flexibility therein well i think i made a comment on the financial instrument in saying that the seven billion which are foreseen are far too little uh, as compared when you look at you know the size of of the region size of the population the enormous different needs from from uh, uh, green transition to digitalization to uh, uh, you know, uh, reducing the gap on, on regional disparities. Tunisia, for instance, that's a big issue. And seven billion is, I'm sorry to say, is nothing. Uh, it says that the seven billion would lead to 30 billion investments, private, public. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, but seven billion is, is far, uh, far too little. By comparison, the Western Balkans, much smaller in terms of population, far much smaller altogether, will receive 12 billion euro uh, in the same period of time. Um, but coming back to the question of uh, 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 climate change and leading to uh, migration, I think for me it's not just climate change, it's already a problem. Egypt um, 
has grown or is about to grow from what 30 million in the 70s 80s i think up to 100 million in 2030 or 40. when you know egypt when you know what what it means in terms of uh, fertile soil what can be done etc this is mad this is not possible this is not just possible president nasser had with unicef develop a, a program to limit birth rate. It was very successful, but then Sadat came to power and abolished it because he was, you know, favoring the uh, Muslim Brothers uh, ideology. As a result, Egypt is not able, even if it had a gr economic growth rate of 8, 10, 15, 20 percent, the economy is absolutely unable to catch up with the increase of demography. So if you add to, indeed, the uh, climate change uh, uh, impact, then this is not sustainable. And certainly Europe cannot sustain, uh, or as the question says, it would collapse or would have to abandon its, its own uh, values. So what to do? Well, this is, I guess, what uh, Olivier Roy uh, said, to, to reinforce, to help the gatekeepers, I'm sorry, to shock some people who says that uh, uh, there should be more free movement except no this is not possible otherwise our societies will just collapse that's clear so this the, the country should be helped in terms of more uh, investments in terms of border management because if people leave it's also because the countries are unable to control their own borders i mean a sovereign country should be able to control its borders for people incoming and people outgoing. That's a minimum that any country, sovereign country, uh, uh, has to, uh, to apply. And, and the third way, I'm sorry, I will shock some people in saying that, there should be a moderation in terms of uh, demographic uh, development in, in, so in the countries and in Africa as well. Otherwise, it's not manageable for them and for us. Thank you very much. And I take your point on the financing that in the end, flexibility doesn't matter so much if you the money is not enough. And so so that that would be because uh, that's the flexibility point I was trying to get to. Branislav, um, I imagine you would like to address the question on the delimitation of the economic zones, but of course, uh, also the climate migration, should you wish to do so? Yes. So firstly, just a little number on uh, Egypt that uh, demography is so strong that on average Egypt society has to provide and create new jobs for roughly one million young people that are entering every year labor market. So it's a pretty huge. It is a challenge for foreign investments. And uh, when we speak about Egypt, Egypt is the only country among the 10 of the Northern Africa and Euromed that achieved in 2020 positive economic growth, actually. This was uh, thanks to investment in the new city, so in the construction and development. So relatively now Egypt is doing well, but there are constraints of, on natural resources, on soil, on water. We know that there are also disputes on, on, on the river Nile and so on and so far. Uh, on the exclusive economic zones, Actually, we are in a very complicated situation there with a memorandum of understanding between Libya and Turkey. Because uh, as I showed in, in the map that uh, was presented during my, my presentation, this, this delimitation that is quite artificial is not only going against the interests and delimitation of zones of our member states, but also against interests of other countries in the region like Egypt. The second remark was that uh, the memorandum of understanding from November 2019 between Libya and Turkey was not endorsed, was not ratified by Libya and Parliament. The third remark is that it is memorandum, so it was not considered as international treaty. However, despite all these objections, and despite uh, doubts of uh, international community and even lawyers or experts in international public law and maritime law, uh, this memorandum was uh, 
registered by UN Register of International Treaties on 30 September 2020, so last year. So now we, we have really, from my point of view, quite ambiguous uh, situation in the region, and uh, I don't have a, a reply how it will be solved. Uh, the solution that uh, some countries uh, try to find, like uh, Greece and Egypt, was to sign bilateral agreements on the limitation of their maritime exclusive zones. So Greece and Egypt, they signed it in August 2020. Of course, that these zones and the zone agreed between Libya and Turkey are overlapping. So there will be certainly a lot of space for international uh, negotiations. Thank you very much, Branislav. Indeed, a very complex issue. Um, Daniel, uh, I, I wanted to, to ask first, would you have any comment on either of the two questions, but also um, to, to maybe come back to your point about East and South, let's call it that way, and the various interests in the EU and, and, and see if you would have any solutions to propose uh, or will the strategic compass be the solution for member states which are not on the Mediterranean to recognize the Mediterranean as a key interest of the EU? Yeah, thank you very much, Elena. Uh, I, I cannot really add to what Branislav has said on the um, exclusive zone, so I leave it there. But on the climate change question, uh, I just want to flag up at least two issues, which is that the first is we have to recognize that um, large parts of North Africa and the Middle East um, are finding it increasingly difficult to keep up uh, the economic uh, situation and social support schemes, if I can put it this way, because of the transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy. And that will increasingly be challenging for them, especially in those countries which have always relied on the, if I could put it this way, oil subsidies uh, for social payments uh, internally. So when we talk about uh, displacement and climate change, actually uh, climate change should be seen, yes, as a challenge uh, risk in itself, but actually it's an aggravator of existing challenges, which we have to keep in mind. Secondly, uh, the question almost hints at the fact that Europe will be free from the challenges of climate change as well. But actually, if you look at most of the data uh, out there, uh, of course, scientists are very fair. They don't separate Africa, Middle East and Europe. So coastal communities, even in Europe, on the EU side of the Mediterranean, will also have significant challenges as time goes by from, from climate change, which, of course, uh, itself is a challenge for the EU, but I would say it further complicates any discussion uh, related to migration or displacement of people and also maybe the political agendas or narratives that may exist in such a, such a context, of course. Um, especially now we see this more of this turn towards, uh, you know, protection of Europe. Uh, I'm not sure how that manifests itself politically as time goes by. Uh, then on the question you posed, Elena, on... Um, East uh, and South. I mean, part of the point of the compass exercise itself was to break down that uh, kind of taboo or that barrier between between member states. And I think from a from a strategic point of view. So when when member states look at the problem, of course, uh, many planners and many um, experts, of course, see the interconnections between uh, what goes on in Eastern security and the Southern security, but. It's always a question of priority. And uh, if, if you're in the Baltics, uh, yes, you can make the conceptual observation that Russia is operative in, this, in the southern dimension, but your principal worry is that Russian tanks are coming over your border. Uh, just the same as in the south. We're probably less uh, worried about Russian tanks uh, hitting our cities, um, but of course we have all of the other challenges uh, of the southern neighborhood. So I would say that maybe we've moved a bit in um, not really a strategic culture because it's still too early, but at least a degree of solidarity, uh, but it's still at the very, very early stages. I think when it comes to the campus, uh, the bolder that we become with certain ideas, the more uh, divisive they will be by their very nature. So I think when we look at the, the issue of Russia's presence in the East and the South, I think a good kind of landing zone or compromise will be uh, to take seriously, for example, hybrid threats much more carefully, 
And there you can actually, when you think about investments in certain capabilities, investments in certain concepts, there is a lot of commonality between the challenges, uh, hybrid threats in the East and hybrid threats that we face in the South, especially when we deploy uh, our security and defense operations and missions. I know that in the East, they're a bit sensitive when we talk about crisis management deployments, because of course the main fear is that air forces operating under an EU flag automatically takes away from NATO uh, reassurance measures in the, in the South, uh, in the East, sorry. So also that's the point about the long term of the campus. It's not just about solidarity, but let's be frank, our member states also have to invest more in their armed forces and the bandwidth that they have to deal simultaneously with the crises. And I'll end on the observation as well, that we always talk about uh, the South uh, and the Eastern dimensions, and we also forget the High North and the Atlantic. Uh, and, uh, and there have been reports even this week of Chinese naval bases on the Atlantic coast as well. I mean, it, it, it's mind boggling. Uh, so we have to be a bit uh, careful to have a, I would say, a 360 degree approach to this, uh, this challenge uh, and this problem. Thank you. If I may, if I may, if I may say a word on, 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 on uh, the Russian influence in, in the region. Um, I'm not sure that overall Russia is more present today uh, in the mainstream uh, zone than it was in the 60s, 70s. Yes, in Libya. But don't forget that until mid-70s, I mean, Egypt was even more important than Syria at the time for Russia, with, you know, military bases uh, uh, for, for air and, and sea. And that was really like a, a Russian colony, so to speak, until after the 73 uh, war. And although Russia is still an influence in Algeria, I have the feeling that it tends to be replaced by China more and more, at least in Algeria. Thank you. Yeah, if Thank I may, you. if I may just add, I of course I agree with this. Uh, I, what I would say is that the tactics are slightly different, right? So uh, the Russians are not conducting, I would say, an ideological uh, competition anymore in the Mediterranean. But it is using, I would say, non-conventional tools or hybrid uh, below the conventional force uh, uh, tactics, the use of of private companies, paramilitary groups, disinformation, which was there, of course, during the Cold War as well. But the problem is for Europeans, um, because, you know, we're, uh, we have a big problem with uh, attribution. And the Russian tactics today allow for a very high degree of deniability. Uh, the same with the Chinese, but they operate in a different way, more with economic persuasion and, uh, and this sort of dependency. But uh, of course, it's not a new threat or a phenomenon from Russia, but uh, it's just very difficult for us to think of how to respond to it. That's the problem, I think. Thank you, Daniel. And may I say on this point that I think the, the, the influence of Russia and China in any area of the EU's neighborhood and beyond is a day, daily issue, which I think nowadays touches in all the work we do in external policies. However, I still have three questions and, and, and six minutes for this panel. So I will read out um, the first two questions, which are on more on the sort of demographics, if I may group them, demography and democracy area. Uh, the first one is uh, by our colleague Anne-Cécile Charlier. Uh, why not invest more in education? If little girls can learn that they can choose to not have children, and I think this refers to something that was said by Pierre Mirel, or to choose to stop having more children, it might have an impact on demography. So this is a question on what the EU can do in that sense. Uh, the second question by our colleague Yonel Zamfir, uh, is the EU prepared with this new strategy? Should a new democratization wave such as the Arab Spring take place in the region? And if not, how should it be better prepared? And a last uh, question by our colleague uh, from the European Council Oversight Unit, Susanna Angel. What is the role of parliamentary diplomacy in the parenthesis Eastern Mediterranean region? So Mediterranean and Eastern Mediterranean. Now, we only have five minutes, so um, I'll, uh, I will go from the last speaker to the first this time, but I would ask you to keep it quite short uh, so that we can finish on time. Uh, and I know these issues are very complex and big. So Branislav, uh, choose you, any of these questions to respond to. Yes. <clears throat> so on education, I would like to say some something. Actually, yes, we all agree it's very important. And actually there is a program of European schools that was developed already by the previous commissioner, Han, responsible for neighborhood and in 2019 in September he opened the first 
school, which we call European School in Tbilisi in Georgia. And there was a program to finance such a network also in the South neighborhood. Uh, one school that could be open in Morocco at the end was uh, cancelled. But I believe that this could be a very good project also to support the, the creation and education of local elites that could uh, then bring the change that we need. Thank you, Branislav. Daniel, your two minutes, parliamentary diplomacy, demography uh, or uh, a new Arab Spring. Thank you, Elena. I think at this point I would like to give my minutes uh, to Professor Morel and Professor Hua, I'm sure have much more to say, but uh, just to emphasize or underline, I think the importance of the parliamentary diplomacy question that was posed. Certainly, uh, I think that that's a very, very important dimension. And I think even uh, First Vice President Metzola referred to that in her opening speech as well. I'm not sure I have the time to get into how to achieve it, but it is certainly a very, very uh, uh, important trust building uh, mechanism, I would say. And with that, uh, thank you to the organizers as well. And I look forward to hearing the two final responses. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Mihal, your final words. All right, uh, education. I mean, certainly that, that's uh, the most important uh, point and, uh, for all the, the countries. And why is it? that Tunisia has been more successful than the others because of President Bourguiba at the time, who imposed education for all, girls and, and boys. And that, that's the key, really. Um, yes, uh, the EU should do more. But if I take my example again of, uh, of Egypt, education has been abandoned. I mean, poor people in the suburbs of, of Cairo, education has been left to whom? Well, to students, Muslim brothers, uh, brotherhood, who, uh, whether medicine, health and education, are teaching, helping uh, in the evening the families. No doubt that they will, you know, they have uh, gained influence through that. So Egypt, yes, and all countries, education should be the first, uh, uh, the first uh, uh, assistance, uh, the, the imp most important part of our assistance program. Arab Springs, wow. I mean, who thought that there would be Arab Springs in 2011? No one, right? Uh, no one knew about it. And we could discuss that for, for a long time. I think the best way to, well, there is an Arab Spring ongoing right now in Egypt, in, uh, sorry, in Algeria. The Iraq movement with every Friday, people demonstrating in the streets. That's a continuation, isn't it? Um, so I think the best way to, to help, I would not say to, to get new Arab Springs, but at least to help in transformation of uh, uh, societies, is through education again and support to civil society. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Hua. I think we should concentrate on some uh, areas because we cannot, you know, uh, deal with uh, all these kind of problems from Morocco to, to Iraq. And I think the priority is Tunisia. You know, it's a small country, it's close to us, it's both a gatekeeper and uh, uh, um, uh, state with uh, uh, many uh, citizens and uh, second generation in Europe. The second point is Libya, you know, uh, uh, because nobody is dealing with a civil society in Libya. And all, once again, it's not a very numerous population. We can do something. And the first point is this, you know, uh, gray zones uh, between Turkey and Syria, where you have millions of population you know, uh, uh, without uh, 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 real. Um, um, education system and nothing. You, know. you have some NGOs working there, but the political conditions have improved recently for different reasons. And I think that there is something to do uh, in th these very populated uh, uh, areas without a, a direct government control. Thank you very much. I, I think uh, everyone who has been following this panel, uh, or over 60 people, would agree that uh, we've raised several issues, which A, I cannot summarize, but B, each offer themselves for a new panel, because they are indeed as complex as, as has been discussed. Um, we are about to leave this event and go to an online world where I'm sure we will all be reading about the latest in Israeli-Palestinian conflicts, uh, just to make clear how, how much this discussion resonates with things that are actually happening. And I, for my whole lifetime, feel that Israeli-Palestinian conflict has been a reality. So I think this in itself points to how, how urgent, how important and how complex it is for actors like the EU to, to act in the Mediterranean. I also leave with some very good optimistic points. Um, 
nuanced in your in your talks, which is how much can be done for education, for democracy, for women, for climate. Uh, so I thank you very much, all of you, for what was really very deep, thought-provoking discussion. I would like to thank the audience for their questions and for attending this in what is, I don't know if everyone is aware, but we have a four-day weekend following this so as of tomorrow. So those that are following are definitely uh, committed to, to the topic. And to say there will be a summary of this event in a blog post on our website uh, and the uh, the recording of, of the of the conversation, if you would like to share, and we will share that with our speakers. Once again, thank you for your participation. Thank you to Branislav for organizing. And perhaps I will turn to Etienne for a final word or to say goodbye. Uh, but thank you on my behalf. And thank you to VP Metzola, who is not here, but her thank contribution you. was thank fundamental. Thank you, everyone. I think it has been an extremely rich discussion. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't add more to that. I would just announce that next week on Wednesday, we will have an, another event that um, the European elections are two years ago now. And we will bring um, um, an academic perspective together with uh, experts that will uh, look at the past election and uh, lessons learned. So I encourage you to uh, register for that event uh, uh, next week uh, on Wednesday. Thanks a lot to everyone.